Hello everyone, welcome to the course. This is our first lesson in the first module. It is probably as much as you can take in in one day, so I would strongly recommend that uh, after you watch this, you give your brain a little rest, maybe flip through the PDF uh, that's available to download so you can look at it some more. But we're gonna jump right in and talk about an overview of the basic elements and principles of composition. The elements and principles are the visual language that we use in painting, printmaking, drawing, all of the different media in the visual arts to communicate. So they're extremely important to understand. So we're going to go through them step by step so that everybody is on the same level playing field. It may be a little bit repetitious to some of you who have had it before, and I apologize for that, but I think it's very important that we all are using the exact same terms and using them the same way, and that we all get to the same basic bar for starting. So the elements and principles are the visual language. They are the equivalent of verbs and nouns that we have in grammar that help us to communicate orally. So understanding how to put those together helps us to communicate clearly with the visual language. These elements can be used to discuss and talk about any of the different media that we work with, whether it is painting, printmaking, photography, any of the different media. The elements and principles apply the same way across individual painting media and across the broader media disciplines. The basic elements, there are four of them, are the ones that all of the other complex elements are constructed from. They are the ones that we're going to concentrate on the most at the beginning of the course. Those elements are line, shape, surface, and color. So we're going to go through these individually one by one and talk about what those terms mean and how they get manipulated and used in creating compositions. The complex elements are made up of combinations of those simple elements and we'll talk about those in the second part of the presentation. The first of those is pattern, the second is motion, the third is space, and the fourth is light. All four of these are made up by manipulating those four basic elements, line, shape, pattern, uh, surface, and color. So you need to understand those four basic ones before you can deal with the complex ones. Line is a very simple element to understand in many ways. We've all had math at some point in our lives, and the definition for a line in geometry functions very well as the definition for a line in art. Line is the distance or connection between two points. Here you can see several different kinds of lines, vertical, diagonal, curvilinear, but they're all still visually connecting the space between two points. There's some variations in line that are very important to understand. You can have real lines and you can have implied lines. Real lines are when those points are physically connected by a mark. So your pencil travels between point A and point B. An implied line is created by our mind's desire to connect things that are similar. So if you look up at the ceiling in the room that you're in right now, if it's got ceiling tiles in it, those are implied lines. Your mind wants to connect each tile together to create a line. Thinking about railroad tracks receding into the distance, the ties that recede back into space, the repetition of those similar elements creates the illusion of a line from the railroad ties. So those are implied lines, both very, very important kinds of lines. You can create variation in line by changing the weight, the value, the texture, or the direction. What I mean by those is that the weight 
is the light, the thickness or the thinness of the line, how fat or skinny the line is. The value is the lightness or darkness, how close to black or white the line is. The texture has to do with the edge of the line, how rough or smooth it is, how fuzzy or soft it is. Direction, which is the one we're going to deal with the most in this unit, is the physical direction that the line takes, vertical, horizontal, diagonal, or curvilinear. It's an extremely important part of understanding line, and it's one of the most crucial ones for composition. So if you can understand how to control direction, you can understand how to create a definite focal point. So we'll be talking about this a good deal this week in this unit. So direction is crucially important. And again, those four basic directions are horizontal, vertical, diagonal, and curvilinear. They each carry a certain degree of implied movement to them. Horizontal is the most still because it is related to our perception of being at rest, of laying down flat on the ground. Vertical has a great deal of implied motion, mainly because we associate it with things that are dropping with the sense of gravity. Diagonal also has a great deal of motion, and if anything, a little bit more than vertical, because we think of things rolling down hills. Curvilinear is one of the more gentle of the line directions. It implies a great deal less motion than vertical and diagonal because it takes longer for your eye to move along it from one end to the other. So it's a slower and more gentle kind of line direction. Not necessarily as slow as horizontal, which implies almost no motion at all, but definitely less movement than diagonal or vertical. So in looking at line directions, I wanted to slow down for just a minute and look at how you find line directions in a subject that you're looking at. So if you look at this photograph of the edge of a marsh, you can see some very strong line directions in there. The first one that you'll notice is the horizon line. It's a horizontal line, a very strong, stable line in the landscape. If I continue tracing the lines that I see in that photograph with the red mark, I would begin to see that there are an awful lot of horizontal lines and vertical lines, and in addition, some few very slowly angled diagonal lines. Those lines give the, the composition a sense of peace, of stability, and a very little, but maybe a slight, gentle motion and movement. The other thing to notice about line direction is the intersection of those lines. That's where the focal point will tend to be created. So line direction is one of your strongest tools to create a definite focal point. And as you can see here, the lines intersect for the most part at the spot where the pine trees move up, the horizon line runs into that line, and that small section of trees juts out into the marsh. So that small section where all of those lines come together, right here in the middle, upper left, um, ends up being a very strong stable focal point. So that is the beginning of understanding how to create a focal point using line direction. We're going to explore that in more detail in the demo that you're going to get later this afternoon, but I want you to process through the compositional elements first before you get to the exercises and the demo. Shape is the second of the simple basic elements and it is defined as any contained area in a composition. It can be contained by a line that wraps around and connects. That's called a contour. It can also be contained by differences in value or color or texture. 
So any distinct difference will create a contained area in a composition and thus a shape. Some of the variations you have in shape are things like geometric versus organic, large versus small, hard versus soft, and positive versus negative. What I mean by those are the geometric, for example, relates to things that have a mathematical definition, things that are angular for the most part, although we do have circles as well, but things that are not organic. Organic shapes have a lifelike form and are very irregular. Large versus small has to do with relative size and it'll give us some visual cues to space, as we'll talk about later. Hard versus soft refers to the edge of a shape, how distinct and clear the sudden change is between the shape and what it's up against. Positive versus negative has to do with the shape and the surrounding area. So if you look at this painting on the right-hand side, you could think about the area of trees and their reflection as being a positive contained shape. What's surrounding those shapes are the blues of the sky and the reflection. You can always, always continue breaking down those positive shapes into smaller and smaller areas of positive versus negative shapes. We will go into that in more detail as we get to the unit on blocking in and simplifying and notan in module two. But for now, just think about positive being the definite shape, which would be the trees that you see here, and negative being the surrounding shapes, which would be in this case, the sky. Here's some examples of a variety of different kind of shapes. In the upper left hand corner you see some geometric shapes. On the upper right hand corner you see an organic shape. At the bottom is a good example of what I was talking about when I referred to positive and negative shape. The positive shape in the bo bottom right hand corner is the oval. The negative shape is the surrounding space. So that brown shape at the bottom that envelops the oval would be a negative shape that helps to define the oval. The way that these become very, very important is in painting is to begin establishing the basic shapes. So we want to learn to see the shapes and to see them in very simplified forms to begin with. It will help us to develop those basic masses and to be able to create the strong notan that's the underlying foundation of most good compositions. So that particular underpainting, the, the lay-in that you saw just then, came from this photograph. The way to create an understanding of those shapes is to begin by looking at your subject really, really looking hard at the subject and looking closely at the subject. Then make a thumbnail sketch that explores those shapes and the values that you see in very simplified ways. And the rule that I use with my students in creating thumbnail sketches is to use three to five values and five to seven shapes. I had my students at the college reciting that yesterday as a mantra. Three to five values, five to seven shapes. Don't go more than that or you'll make it too complex. So when you're looking at the basic underlying shapes, keep it simple. Surface is the third of the basic elements. It's the tactile quality of a composition, something that appeals to your sense of touch. And the variations that are available in surface are physical versus implied, rough versus smooth. And those really are sliding scales rather than independent opposites. So if you think about physical surface, an object that you can reach out and touch has a physical surface that's rough or smooth or in between. 
You can also have physical surface in a painting through the physical quality of the paint. If you have very thick paint, very impasto, thickly applied paint, it will have a physical tactile surface. Implied surfaces come from trying to create the simulation of a physical surface. It's a lot more difficult to do and requires a real understanding of value, color, shape, and pattern. Rough versus smooth is something that's very important to understand. A lot of times when people think of surface and texture, they think of only rough and they forget about smooth. So make sure in your compositions that you're creating a full range of surface that goes from very rough and very tactile to very smooth and you'll create a rich, rich surface for your viewer to look at. This painting has a, a strong range of surfaces from very, very smooth to very much thicker paint and it makes the viewer want to reach out and touch it. So you can see a certain degree of it when you're looking at the entire painting, but when you look at a close-up of it, you can begin to see how thickly applied the paint was so that there's a rich variation all the way from thin paint to much thicker paint. And that begins to appeal on a subconscious level to your viewer and it invites them to come closer and reach out and touch. Now you don't want people to touch it and rub on your painting too much, but you do want to engage them through surface. Color and you may have seen the webinar that I had over the past two weeks that was talking about color. Um, so you may be familiar with some of these terms already. Color is defined by four aspects. Value, hue, intensity, and temperature. And as we go through those, I'm going to give you the general definitions right now without going into enormous detail because we're going to spend a lot of time during the course looking at those four aspects of color. Hue is simply the color's position on the color wheel. So on the right you'll see a fairly simple color wheel that I mixed using the split pr uh, double primary uh, palette that I recommend. Going from the primaries, red, yellow, and blue, to the secondaries, orange, violet, and green to the tertiaries, which are mixtures of primaries and secondaries. But just think of the hue as being the chroma, the position of the color on the color wheel or the spectrum. Value is the lightness or darkness of a color. It's what you see when you remove the chroma from a painting. So the painting on the left has the full chroma, intensity, and temperature that the actual painting has. On the right, you can see a grayscale version of that painting where all you are able to recognize are the values, but you can see where it runs from the darkest darks to the lightest lights. That gives you a full sense of depth, even without the rest of the aspects of color. Intensity has to do with saturation, with the brightness or dullness of the color. The color swatch that you see on the left is a fairly dull gray that's created by mixing lots of the other colors together. That color has very little saturation or pure color present. It's got mixtures of lots of different colors and when you do that they cancel each other out and create a neutral. Neutrals are very very important but you need to understand the difference between a neutral and a bright color. On the right are two very bright distinct colors. The coral and the Indian yellow sort of orange on the right are very intense colors, much more intense than the neutral that's on the left. If you think about their values, their inherent values, the neutral one is a little darker, whereas our more intense colors that I have over there are a little lighter. And that doesn't mean all intense colors are light or that all neutrals are dark, but that colors can have different intensities and different values. The fourth aspect of color is temperature. And temperature 
refers to the apparent warmth or coolness of a color. On its most simple level, let me go back to the color wheel for a minute. On its most simple level, you can divide the color wheel in half, roughly running from the cool red to the yellow green. And the half to slightly to the left is warm, and the half slightly to the right is cool. That's a very simplistic understanding of temperature, and it's very useful, but not nearly as useful as understanding relative temperature or the relationship of one color to another in relationship to their temperature. So if you look at the first two swatches of color here, you have cinnabar green and Indian yellow. Cinnabar green, when it's next to Indian yellow, looks a little bit cooler. Indian yellow, when it's next to violet, looks a little bit warmer. If I switch to those around and put the cinnabar next to the violet, the cinnabar would be the warmer one. So understand that relative temperature has to do with the relationship between two colors when you put them next to each other. One will be a little warmer and one will be a little cooler in relationship to each other. The more complex elements are pattern, motion, space, and light. And remember that they are made of different kinds of combinations of those basic simple elements that we talked about earlier. Pattern is simply regular repetition. So if you think about it as music, beats that appear in a very regular way, that's a very regular pattern. Those first four bars that you see in the diagram below create a regular pattern because they are repeated at regular intervals. But there's an interruption in that pattern, very similar to syncopation and music. So that would be a more irregular rhythm or pattern there at the end. Pattern is very useful for creating a sense of movement and motion and unity in a composition. So in this painting, you can see a number of different patterns. There's a pattern created by the repetition of those vertical tree trunks. It becomes an irregular pattern or rhythm due to the spacing between some of those trunks in the foreground. The trunks in the background create a more regular repetition. That sense of pattern helps to anchor the composition visually. The second of the complex elements is motion, which can be defined as movement. Now you can have real physical movement in an artwork, but in painting, for the most part, we're talking about the movement that is created by moving the viewer's eye around a composition or about the implied motion that you get from the angles of the marks that you're using that create a sense that, for example, in this painting, the clouds are moving quickly across the sky. One of the keys to understanding movement is, again, repetition. And there's a rule that I use in teaching composition called the rule of threes. And it creates a strong movement or motion excuse me, of the viewer's eye around the composition. So the rule of threes is that when you put something in a composition in one place, you need to repeat it in two others so that it's repeated three times. That will create a strong movement around the competition, uh, competition, composition. So if you look at this painting, those small dabs of light blue at the horizon line that indicate buildings. That's a thalo blue and white mixture. That color is repeated in several places at the top of the composition. So you see it up here in the upper right hand corner in the clouds, in the light part of the clouds, in the upper left, and in the top for the sky. That draws the viewer's attention from the top to the bottom of the composition. You can see it repeated as well in that warm pinkish color that is in the bottom of the composition 
as well as in the top in the clouds. So as soon as you repeat something at least three times, you're going to create a sense of movement or motion in the composition. Space is the illusion of depth. And for the most part, most people are trying to create a strong sense of space in their paintings. And that's what we're going to talk about in this course. I'm going to assume that what you're trying to do is create a sense of depth. There are a lot of artists that are not concerned about creating depth at all, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think that most of you are probably trying to get a handle on how to use color and light to, and value to create that sense of depth. One of the ways that you get a sense of depth in this painting is by creating a strong, distinct foreground, middle ground, and background. So the foreground would be the area of grass or the field that's closest to you. The middle ground would be where those buildings meet the trees towards the horizon line. The top of the clouds right here, that's almost middle ground. You'd read it as middle ground in depth. The background would be the distant clouds and the trees that are way in the distance that have become lighter as they move back into space. So we're going to talk about several different methods later in the course of ways to use color and value and line and surface to, and texture to create a sense of depth in a painting. The last of the complex elements is light or illumination. And you create a sense of illumination through the way that you manipulate color. That is the single most important element in creating a sense of illumination. So you use all four elements to a aspects of color to a degree, hue, value, intensity, and temperature to create a sense of illumination. But the two crucial tools to do that are intensity and temperature. And you can see here at the horizon line where that splash of illumination goes across the field that I've created that sense of illumination through the very intense pinkish orange color that's there and through the warmth of that color. So that creates a sense that there is color falling across the landscape. You package all of those elements up, the simple ones and the complex ones, with three different things that will unify that composition. Think about these as the rules of grammar. The earlier elements are the parts of speech. Unity comes from grammar itself, from knowing how to put those together. So the ways that you create unity are through rhythm, balance, and proportion. Rhythm is repetition. Anytime you repeat things, go back to the rule of threes. You're going to create a sense of rhythm that will pull the viewer's eye through a composition. Balance is a sense of equilibrium. Trust yourself on this. You'll know when your composition's not balanced. If when you're looking at it, your head tilts to the left or the right, you're not in balance. We are innately built to understand balance because we require a sense of balance in order to move through space. So if it feels off, trust your gut. You may not know how to rectify this situation, but you'll know when it's off. When it's off, ask for help. Proportion has to do with relative amounts. So you can have relative amounts with color, with surface, with line, or with texture, with any of those basic elements. We will talk about those a lot throughout the course. So I wanted here towards the end to look at a couple of different compositions and think about how those three things have been used to create a sense of unity here. So if you look at rhythm, there's a rhythm in this landscape through the mark, through the texture that I created by using the palette knife in a certain way. So you see a similar repeated mark throughout the composition. You also see colors repeated. 
that help to pull your eye around, that creates a strong rhythm. You see a sense of balance. It's not symmetrical balance. You don't have exactly the same thing on the left as you do on the right, but it's asymmetrical balance that creates a sense of stability. It doesn't feel like your head's going to lean to the left or to the right. There is a strong sense of proportion both in the rendering or creating a sense of real space, but also in the relationship of one color to the other. So all of those things have been used to create a sense of unity in the composition. Lastly, I want to talk about the principles. There are a lot more than just the four that I have listed here, but they're the ones that we're going to look at most closely during the course, and especially in the first part of this module. Um, emphasis, which is also a focal point. The area of the composition that has the strongest visual weight is going to create an emphasis or a focal point. You can also use line direction to create a strong focal point. Most compositions work the best when they have a strong focal point, especially if that focal point is out of the middle or out of the center. So we're going to work on keeping our compositions non-centralized. The second of the principles that I want to talk about are contrast and similarity. Those two are closely related. So having a composition that has a balance between contrast or difference and similarity will help to create a strong sense of interest, visual interest in the composition. So we're going to look again at an example. In this painting, the focal point ends up being roughly at the intersection of the vertical and horizontal thirds. That's called the rule of thirds. So if you divided this composition vertically at the thirds and horizontally at the thirds, the intersection of those lines would be right here, roughly right here. That's where the focal point is. And you'll notice that the strongest visual contrast is right there. The lines point to right there so that it creates this strong sense of visual weight in this area right here. Most contrast in color, the most contrast in value, most contrast in temperature. So that creates a strong focal point or emphasis. Looking at similarity and difference, there's more difference in this area than in the area to the right, which helps to, again, create a strong focal point. Again, in this one, if you look at emphasis and focal point, this time the focal point tends to be a little bit more towards the right-hand lower corner instead of the upper left. Nine times out of ten, you want to orient your focal point at one of those intersections of the rule of thirds. So where those vertical and horizontal lines intersect is a really great place to create a focal point. It never hurts to create a secondary focal point as well. You'll create a much stronger composition if you do. So again, think about similarity and difference, contrast, emphasis, and focal point. If we can put those things together, but the basic elements, the complex elements, the methods to unify a composition, and the uh, methods to the principles, we'll create very strong compositions in our paintings. So right now I want you to kind of maybe reflect over the, the presentation that we've just had, flip back through it, Download the PDF if you'd like and pop over to the Facebook group and post any questions you might have because we covered an awful lot in a fairly short period of time. Thanks for your attention and thank you once again for joining me for Composition, Color, and Light.